Let's open our Bible to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, which is our text. Here Paul says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. We thank God for the 16th century Protestant Reformation, which is the greatest revival of the church, second only to Pentecost, according to church historian Philip Shaw. And it, do, it will do us good to remember it on a yearly basis, and indeed we do. It has become a good tradition in Reformed and Presbyterian churches to observe Reformation Sunday. Right? The last Sunday of October is Reformation Sunday. And the BP Church should continue this good tradition. What did we gain from the Reformation? I think we gained a whole lot. We thank God for the precious truths and the precious things we have gained from the Reformation. Without the Reformation, all of us will still be in darkness, in deep superstition, still blind, blind to the truth, still guilt-ridden with sin. And there's no salvation apart from Christ. And we would be Christless if not for the Reformation that brought us back to Christ and His Word. So we want to thank the Lord for the Reformation. And in the Reformation, what did we gain? Well, before we can talk about the gain, we must talk about the lost. What did we lose in the Reformation? Now, over here in chapter 3 to 6, we read of Paul, what he had to lose in order to gain. And what Paul lost was what was initially very important to him. But then later he discovered all these things were nothing at all, so that he might gain what was truly valuable and eternal. So over here, Paul talks about the confidence he had in the flesh. And verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any... If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. May we never, never trust in our own personal intellect and abilities. Here Paul had to lose all these things. At first he trusted his own personal intellect, talents, and abilities the good he thought he was doing. And he thought that he was doing God service by all his works, religious works. And he says here, I was very, very proud. I'm proud of my race. There is pride of race and pride of face over here. And he trusted in his background, his pedigree. He says here, circumcised, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Pride of race, pride of face. Please do not think that if you have a noble background or a royal pedigree, you automatically qualify for heaven, that God should look at you with 
more attention or with special attention. And often that's how we think. Because sin is full of self. Right? What is the letter in the center of sin? It's the letter I. It's all the sinful I, the selfish I. which gets us all prideful and pride also. What is the letter right smack in the middle of pride? It's the I. Self-worship, self-love, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-worth, self-promotion. We are full of selfishness and selffulness. Full of self. And Paul was like that. He thought that he was intrinsically very good. And God should pay special attention to him. And not only did he have, you know, he came from this proud race, he also was highly capable concerning works, he excelled in his religiosity. In verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. Indeed, Paul was a very religious man, given to full-time religious service since young, he had to go through rabbinical training, and he excelled in his training, in his studies. And he, and he studied under the famous Rabbi Gamaliel, renowned in all Israel. It's as good as someone saying, well, I studied in Harvard or Yale or Oxford or Cambridge, and not only in these schools, well, I topped the class, while well, Paul was like that. He topped his class. He was so outstanding. He scored an A+. Plus. And after he graduated from a young age, he was so quickly recruited to join the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews. And he wanted to be number one among all the fellow scribes and Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, so much so that he went the second mile in terms of zeal, persecuting the church. And he thought that by doing all these things, he will gain God's approval and acceptance. How wrong he was. And Martin Luther was also like this, full of religious zeal. But Luther, unlike Paul, was uh, not full of self. He was, you know, Martin Luther was so sensitive to his sin and sinfulness. Paul was full of self, but Luther was full of sin, full of sensitivity to his sinfulness. And he was plagued terribly by his guilt, the guilt of his sins. And throughout his life, he was trying to find a way out because he always felt condemned. And he was very miserable. And so where is salvation? How to be saved? In those days in the Roman church, well, he was told, you must be very religious. You must do a lot of good works. And so Luther, thinking that that was the way to gain entrance into heaven, well, got himself enrolled into an Augustinian monastery. He became a monk. And he chose the, the strictest sect the strictest order, the Augustinian order, very strict discipline in terms of daily life and living. 
And he thought that by all his monkish works, his sins can be forgiven and he will be accepted by God. But the more he did, the more he practiced his religion, which is full of superstition, he felt more and more miserable. The guilt was still there. I am so sinful. He felt always condemned. Couldn't get out. Almost drove him mad. And he said, if, if all the monkish works could get me to heaven, I'll be in first place. I'll be right there in the front because I have accomplished and have done all of them. Well, just like what Paul says here, as touching the law of Pharisee. And as touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Well, Luther was like this. But could find no salvation, no joy, no peace, no deliverance. Just like Paul. And Luther also thought that maybe he had to pay a visit to Rome, make a pilgrimage to Rome, the holy city, and maybe there in the holy city, you know, the holiness of that city will rub off on him. And so when he went to Rome and again performed all those superstitious ceremonies and acts, he couldn't find any peace. In fact, he testified how he declined uh, the holy stairs, the scala sancta, right? the holy stairs. These were the stairs Jesus purportedly climbed right, uh, to see uh, Pilate when he was on trial. And these steps, which were in Jerusalem, were transported to Rome, and now they built a, a, a cathedral over the steps, 28 marble steps. And it's said that if you, if you climb on these steps, not on your feet, but on your knees, these 28 steps, one by one, and each step you take or you make on your knees, uh, you must say the Lord's Prayer. And when you reach the top, well, you get nearer to heaven. And Luther did that. But after he reached the top, he felt even more miserable. He felt very foolish. And he wondered whether this is the case. I'm nearer to heaven or, or not. I, he felt that he was nearer to hell instead of heaven. And he fled from that place. So he couldn't find salvation at all. In the church, neither in himself, whatever good deeds he had done did not help him one single bit to rid his soul of this guilt of sin and misery. But God had mercy on Luther as much as God had mercy on the Apostle Paul. Remember how Paul, who was then Saul of Tarsus, he was on his way to Damascus to arrest the Christians, commit them to prison. And then along the way, the Lord Jesus graciously met him and said, Saul, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. You are hurting yourselves. You think by persecuting the church, you're doing me a service, God a service? No, not at all. You are, in fact, hurting yourself. You are persecuting me. Why are you persecuting me? And Jesus is Jehovah himself. And Paul, right there and then, was wonderfully converted. He now saw the light the light of Christ. And Luther also experienced something quite similar, the light of the gospel, the light of Christ, not through a personal vision or appearance of the Lord, but through his word, through the Holy Scriptures. 
Luther later on became professor of biblical studies at the University of Wittenberg. And so he had to teach the Bible. So he began to study the Bible. And when he, when he read the book of Romans, the very first chapter, and verse 17, he came across this most wonderful verse. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Luther, you are striving and you're seeking for righteousness. But it has always eluded you. You found it in the wrong place. Not in yourself. Not in the church, but in me. And it's not your works, but my work. My work for you when I was here on earth. I kept the commandments of God perfectly for you through my active obedience. And finally, I paid the price for the forgiveness of sins, redeemed you by my blood when I was crucified on the cross. I shed my precious blood so that all your sins can be forgiven. So not your righteousness, Luther, my righteousness. And that's the same with Paul. Paul, not your righteousness, but my righteousness, my sacrifice and atoning work for you on the cross, shedding my precious blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And finally, I was buried. And on the third day, uh, this is indisputable, a historical fact, I rose from the dead, the resurrection. And now I'm the resurrection of life. You want to live? You simply believe. Believe in me. Trust in me. Confess me. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God had raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. It's just this simple trust and belief and faith and confession that will save us totally and completely. And on the spot, uh, not your work, which is so miserable, my work, which is so excellent. I've paid it all. And Luther, when he, when he read this verse in Romans 1, verse 17, that is faith and faith alone that saves. Now the Holy Spirit convicted his heart and converted him. The gospel light shone in the, into his mind, into his heart, and he believed with all his heart, and he was gloriously saved. And he experienced the joy and the peace of God. And he taught the gospel and the word of God with great confidence and clarity. So much so that his students loved him for it. But to gain all this, you have to lose to lose yourself, uh, no more self but Christ. And that's why in Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the flesh and the, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I, but Christ. And that's what the Lord Jesus, say, Jesus said. If you want to follow me, you must deny self and take up your own cross and you follow me. So you must lose all yourself. You must not count yourself worthy. You are very unworthy. You must count the Lord Jesus Christ worthy. Only he is worthy. There must be no self-esteem. You must esteem Christ above all. 
then you will gain, you will gain a whole lot. You will gain salvation when you lose yourself and your superstitions. And that was what happened to Luther in the 16th century. That was what happened to Paul right there in the 1st century. And the way of salvation is still the same. Don't be selfish. Don't be selfful. Uh, be full of Christ and full of His grace. Be full of faith, simply trusting in the Lord Jesus. And so that's why Paul here can say, but what things were gained, were gained to me. He thought, he thought his background, he thought his, his studies and his training, his degrees. He thought that his own good work, his zeal, even persecuting a church, his own personal righteousness was gain. Actually, it was all loss. The things, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency. And this is a good word. In the original, is, it is the word hupereko. And hupereko comes from two words, the preposition huper, which means above, and echo means to have, to hold. So you must hold on to, to Christ and hold him up at the highest level. It has to do with our thinking. We must have the highest view of the Lord Jesus Christ and of His Word, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Put Him on the highest pedestal in your thinking and in your feelings. You, how should you think of yourself? Right there at the bottom, no better than dirt or dung. But Christ, on the pedestal, at the highest level, not just a high level, but the highest, no one above him. You must put Christ on such a pedestal. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung, dung. Things in the past that were precious to me, it's actually rubbish. The Greek word here is skubalon. Trash, garbage. I don't know whether I can use this four-letter word or not. But I better not. But you know what it is. I mean, really, it's, it's that. It's just that. Anyway, dung is a four-letter word too, right? That I may win Christ, that I may win Christ. And Christ is all in all. If you have Christ, you have everything. Abundant life right now and eternal life forevermore. So good. And all this by grace alone. It's not because we deserve it. We don't deserve it any of this. All that we deserve is God's justice and God's judgment because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have broken His commandments, His laws. We deserve only the justice and judgment of God. But God was gracious. He showed mercy and sent His only begotten Son out of love to die on the cross to save us from our sins. And how we thank the Lord for that. So it's purely by the grace of God alone and by faith alone, not by works. And it is in Christ alone. He, there's only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, no other savior. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only true and living way. 
It's only through Him. No one else. And yes, what was gained to Luther, uh, he counted also as dung. It's not through the Pope, not through the priest, not through priestcraft, and not through the church that I'm saved, and not what I can do or have done, which is all rubbish. It's Christ and the excellency of the knowledge of Christ that's found in what? In the Scriptures. So what did the Reformation gain? For us, or it gained for us salvation. Right? Salvation through the gospel. By grace, through faith in Christ alone. And based on Scripture alone. So that's another thing that the Reformation gained for us. A return to the Scriptures. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. And how we thank God for, for the Word. It is not human intelligence or rationalism, not our reasoning powers that can get us anywhere near to God. Not sophistry, not by way of speculation. It must be truth. And we must be certain about the truth. And we can only know the truth from God's Word. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, make you see. And not only that, you can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. And that's what the Reformation gained for us also, Scripture. And you know, after the Reformation, after the Reformation was such a success, the Roman Catholic Church was, was planning a counter-Reformation. Many people got saved because now the Bible was placed in their hands, translated into many languages, and people read for themselves what it means to be saved and how to be saved. And God's Spirit was working powerfully to convict and convert. And so the Roman Catholic Church sought to counter the Reformation. And how did they go about doing it? Well, they say all these things. All these beliefs they have, based on Scripture and Scripture alone, then we must tackle the Scriptures, undermine their Scriptures, cause them to lose faith in, in Scripture, and then they will give up, right? And return to Mother Church. It's not Scripture and Scripture alone. And how did they go about doing it? You know, the Roman Catholic Church also has a bunch of scholars, very intelligent men, who use their scholasticism to try to undermine the faith of the saints to destroy the scriptures, to destroy, to destroy this doctrine of scripture alone, sola scriptura. And so they came up with methods, philosophical, critical methods of reading and studying the scriptures because now they cannot prevent the scriptures from being read by the people, but they can insert and cast doubt on the scriptures, cause people to think badly of the scriptures or to cause them to doubt the veracity or truthfulness of the scriptures. And so they came up with all these philosophical, critical methods to try to change people's thinking and understanding on the scriptures. And one of them is textual criticism. How they say you don't have the Bible, at least the fullness of the Bible, the perfection of the Scriptures. It's no more, they say, because the Bible has hundreds of thousands of mistakes because what we have are only copies of the Scriptures. 
we don't have the autographs anymore. And these copies show a lot of scribal errors, a whole lot of mistakes. So you cannot trust in your Bible. The Bible you have in your hands, you cannot trust. Full of mistakes. So you must trust the church. The church will tell you what is true. And the Pope is a successor of Peter. And he will know the truth and tell you the truth, not the scriptures. And today, the church is full of confusion because of the multitude of these modern versions, which all speak very differently, with different meanings, not the same. And today, by and large, Christians cannot say the Bible today, the Bible we have presently is infallible, inerrant. It's only infallible, inerrant in the past, at the very beginning, at first, but no more. After all these thousands of years, so, sorry to say, we don't have a 100% perfect Bible without any mistake today. Well, that you have already fallen into the snare and trap of the Roman church. They want you to think like this. But the reformers in those days, the Reformation saints and scholars, the reformers, uh, they defended the faith. They saw this as a very dangerous attack. And they said, no, the Bible was not only infallible and inerrant in the past, it is also infallible and inerrant today. Our sole supreme final authority of faith and practice. And how do we know this? Uh, they say, we go back to the scriptures. Truly, sola scriptura. And the Bible, they say, is self-authenticating. Now, that's the excellency, you see. The, you know, the, your, your epistemology, your way of thinking must be such. You must have excellent thoughts of God, of Christ, and His Word. Nothing can be above God. Nothing can be above the Lord Jesus. Nothing can be above the Scriptures. Sola Scriptura. So they appealed to the authority, the sole, sole supreme final authority of the Scriptures itself. The Bible is self-authenticating and self-interpreting. And so they look at the Scriptures and in the scriptures, they say, they found that God has promised to preserve his word. Not only as a whole, but also in all its parts, to the jot and tittle, till heaven and earth pass. One jot, one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And that's why in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a reformation, a reformed confession of faith, chapter 1, paragraph 8, says most explicitly the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures being immediately inspired by God are by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages. The Bible was not only perfect in the past, infallible and errant, but also perfect today. And we have it in our hands. And by the logic of faith, we know what it is, where it is. And we can say for sure, thus saith the Lord, it is written and it's right here. Uh, not the philosophical sophistry of scholasticism, but a simple childlike faith. Right? Biblical fideism, uh, by faith alone. Faith is not just believing in the Lord Jesus. At the very beginning, when you confess the Lord as your Savior, you must continue to live by faith. Even as a Christian, even in your understanding, reading and studying of the Bible, you must apply faith. And Scripture interprets Scripture. And from Scripture, you get all the wisdom and the knowledge you will need. Even the, the principles to interpret the Bible must come from the Bible itself. And when you really believe in the Bible in such a way, then you begin to be wise. And the Holy Spirit, who will guide you in all truth, will show you right? and guide you to the truth and give you that wisdom that only God can give. 
And so today, we stick with the Reformation Bible. The authorized King James Bible is a Reformation Bible based upon what? Divinely inspired and divinely preserved texts. And God's people, filled with the Holy Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit and filled by the Spirit, when they read the Scriptures, spiritual things, spiritual words are spiritually discerned. And with the Holy Spirit within them, they have a spiritual mind and heart. They have the highest view of Scripture. They have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Uh, they can see, yes, this is my Jesus speaking. This, these are his words. And they have received all these words as God's words. Infallible, inerrant. No doubt. So we must have that Reformation faith. And we thank God we still have this Reformation Bible. I pray we'll hold fast, right? Not only hold fast, but hold up very, very high. This scripture that God has inspired and preserved, our sole supreme final authority of faith and practice, and cast away all these sophisticated methods of the intellectuals and the rationalists. And they may write journal articles and papers, and they may sound and look very impressive, but it's all empty. And Paul says, I count them as dung. And Luther also considered all these things as rubbish. All the superstition and the sophistry. What did we lose? We lost the superstition and the sophistry of men. And what did we gain? Uh, precious things. We gained salvation, the salvation and the scripture of God. How we thank the Lord for the Reformation. Let, let us never forget this. Let us study history. Let us study theology. Let us know the Lord and know his word. And once we have the Lord Jesus and his word, we really have everything. May the Lord help and bless us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee so much for the truth of thy word. And how we thank thee that thou has been very good to save thy people, even the Apostle Paul and also Martin Luther and all the first century saints and those in the 16th century and onwards and even us today. Thank thee, O Lord, for thy spirit who gives us wisdom. We just pray, O Lord, for more and more faith. Our faith would grow and increase as we love thee more and as we know thy word more and more. We will never doubt, never deny thee, but always confess the Lord Jesus to live by faith. From faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. And we know that without faith, it's, it is impossible to please thee. For they that cometh to thee must believe that thou art surely the living and true God. And thou art everything that you say you are in thy word. So help us to please thee by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.